Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we've got a, another video in our battle series. This one is about the Doolittle Raid. We have previously covered this topic before to a lesser extent. Uh, so this is also one of the videos in our remake series. And uh, this one was specifically requested by a viewer uh, who made a donation to go along with it. So we're redoing this at this time because of that donation and because of a uh, classroom program we're doing this month. Now, why are we doing the program this month? Well, April 18th is the anniversary of the Doolittle Raid. So uh, in the month of April, we are holding two classroom activities on board as part of our student day series which will use uh, the Doolittle Raid as a basis for some math problems that we're going to uh, work students through, in addition to a tour of this ship. If you have a video topic that you really want to see me talk about, uh, let us know in the comment section down below. We get to them eventually. If you want to give your video topic a priority, consider making a donation to the museum and requesting that video along with your donation. If you would like to join us for that uh, program, there's a link in the description. It is free for anyone who can come out in person thanks to the donation. Also, uh, if you would like to try the lesson plan on your own at home, you don't live close enough to the battleship to come out in person, or the, the dates we're doing it this month uh, don't work for you, that'll be linked in the description as well. So with all that preamble out of the way, the Doolittle Raid was an operation using Navy aircraft carriers and Army medium-range bombers to attack Tokyo and some other Japanese cities just four months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The United States did not yet have bases near Japan to launch this attack, and so mating of Army bombers with Navy carriers on a one-way mission was the only way to make this attack possible. The attack would be successful, and despite its success, it would not spawn future uh, collaborations between the Army and Navy in this way, with uh, Army aircraft attacking bases from Navy uh, ships. So that, that's kind of interesting that even though this is a success, it's not carried over. Uh, however, the, the repercussions of the Doolittle Raid are pretty far-reaching in the war, and we'll get to those later on. Each of the 16 B-25B bombers, which were modified for the raid, had five crew members on board. Uh, of the 80 men who participated in the raid, three were killed outright, uh, two drowned, and one fell off of a cliff. Eight were captured, with three being executed and one dying during their imprisonment by the Japanese. A further, a further 13 air crewmen would survive the raid, make it back to the United States, and then be killed later in World War II. Uh, and five of the air crewmen were impounded by the Russians. Additionally, all 16 aircraft were lost. So when, when you're looking at airframes, it was a 100% loss rate. Uh, when, you're, when you're looking at uh, the 80 members of the raid, the raiders, uh, they were remarkably successful in surviving the uh, initial raid and uh, had a pretty reasonable chance of making it back to friendly lines eventually. So uh, let's look at the raid. President Roosevelt personally directed the military to come up with a way to strike back at Japan uh, in late December 1941. So Roosevelt didn't too often directly intervene in military matters, but uh, following the attack on Pearl Harbor, he specifically said, I, I don't care how much damage we do, but you've got to find a way to attack Japan for national morale. Uh, and so the military started looking for how the heck do we attack Japan? Japan had very successfully occupied all of the allied uh, islands around themselves, creating a series of concentric rings of island bases uh, to protect the home islands from 
the allies in China, India, Australia, uh, and the United States. So any allied raiding force has to fight its way through these concentric rings of islands to get to the home islands. Uh, and as we know, it ultimately took four years for the U.S. military uh, and the other allies to be able to do that uh, and crack through these rings. And obviously the tactics that we eventually em employed, the technology we eventually employed, um, didn't quite exist yet in 1941. So... Everybody's sitting around, scratching their heads, and a Navy captain named Francis Lowe, who was both a qualified submarine skipper and uh, had captained a destroyer and been on a number of other ships, and at, at the time he was in Admiral King's staff, was watching Navy twin-engine patrol bombers landing in Norfolk. And one of the airfields in Norfolk was painted with the outline of an aircraft carrier flight deck for uh, flight training for naval aviators. So he's watching these twin-engined uh, patrol bombers taking off from this runway, uh, and he starts to notice that, you know, the length of an aircraft carrier flight deck, or roughly 800 feet depending on the carrier, uh, was enough for one of these bombers to take off from. And so these bombers aren't particularly heavy loaded. However, they're unmodified, so surely they could find a bomber. Uh, the U.S. has a dozen different models of bomber at this point in the war. Uh, so surely one of those can be specially modified for a mission. And he takes it up to his boss, Admiral King. And uh, Admiral King says, hey, that, that's a, a good idea. And he takes it up the chain of command, and everybody's like, hey, this might be the way that we can do it. Uh, so they find aviation pioneer Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, who uh, had done a lot of both civilian and military work with aircraft development. And Doolittle says, yeah, I'll, I'll volunteer for that. I, I would love the opportunity to lead this force. And they go to uh, the one bomb group that has been issued B-25s, Doolittle, his first task is to figure out what kind of bomber he wants to use, and he eventually settles on the B-25. It's got a small enough wingspan that uh, it can sort of fit, and it can do about two-thirds of the range that they want it to. So by removing some weight, getting rid of some of the guns on board, some of the radio equipment, some of the other stuff, uh, and by adding extra fuel tanks and maybe reducing the bomb load, uh, he can modify these planes to work. So he decides on the B-25. Uh, the B-25 is a relatively new aircraft. It hasn't been used in combat yet, and there's only one uh, bombardment group that's been fully issued it. So that one has the most experienced pilots. They go to that bombardment group and they say, anybody want to volunteer for a super dangerous mission? I can't tell you what it is, but uh, if you want a chance to get into the war, come with me. Uh, so they solicit 24 flight crews from B-25s for this mission, and they're initially thinking that uh, we'll have 24 do training, hopefully we'll have 20 perform the mission. Uh, and, and sure enough, as, as expected, a couple of these aircraft are destroyed in training, uh, a couple of these flight crews don't perform as well as others at the uh, specialized training to take off in short distances, and not all the aircraft are modified in time. And so after a relatively short preparation period where, where they have to basically relearn how to fly, how to navigate, and how their aircraft are balanced, they start to ship out. And why do they have to relearn all this? Normally, these high-level bombers get up to altitude where the air is thin, and they have pretty good range, and uh, then they fly at that altitude. Typically, you would have leading groups doing the navigating, everybody else is just following, you'd be escorted by fighters. Um, and, and so th this mission is completely different. These aircraft are going to take off from the carriers and they're immediately going to go. They're not going to form up into flight groups. So every flight crew has to be able to navigate on their own. Uh, and they're flying at wave type, wave top height to avoid detection so it can be a surprise attack. Uh, and so with basically just familiarization training and still not being told what they're actually doing, they uh, are sent over to California where their aircraft are craned onto the aircraft carrier Hornet, which is brand new, has just completed uh, shakedown crews and everything in the Atlantic, where she was built. And she and the light cruiser Nashville go around from Norfolk to uh, 
California through the Panama Canal. And uh, then these aircraft, because they can't land on the carrier, there's not enough room for that. They're not modified with tail hooks. They are picked up and craned on. They decided they're going to put 16 aircraft on Hornet. 15 of them will be Raiders, and one will be uh, launched relatively quickly so that uh, to prove that they can do it. Well, they get all 16 on there and then they decide well, none of these flight crews want to be out of the mission and fly home now, so let's just take all 16 for the mission. Cool. We, we proved in training that we can do it from a, a runway marked with a short certain length, so, so surely we can do it from an actual carrier. Not to spoil it, they were right, they could. So, Hornet and Nashville put out to sea. They're able to meet up with Halsey's Task Force 16, which includes the aircraft carrier Enterprise, three heavy cruisers, and eight escorting destroyers, and, and two oilers. Hornet's flight deck is filled with these army bombers. They cannot operate their own aircraft. And so it's very important to partner Hornet with Enterprise so that Enterprise can provide the combat air patrol with their Wildcat fighters and the scouting with their Dauntless dive bombers. Uh, and this is really the, the first instance during the war where American carriers are paired up. Typically they're operating in disparate task groups. That way a Japanese attack can only sink one at any given time. And the U.S. has only eight carriers anywhere in the world at this point. Uh, only three of them in the Pacific. Although by April they're up to five of the eight, I believe. So they're... They're getting there, but still, it's a risk to pair two of these critical national assets uh, for one mission that, that isn't even supposed to attain any serious strategic objectives. Halsey, of course, is the premier carrier admiral. He's given command. Hornet is being commanded by then-captain Mark Mitcher, who will go on to be one of the great carrier admirals of the war and is... Uh, a very decisive individual possessed with good judgment, which he will demonstrate during the raid. So the uh, raiders on their carriers set off across the Pacific. They take a northern route, very similar to what the Japanese did to attack Pearl Harbor, and this way they're avoiding many of the Japanese possessions. Uh, and it even gives some people the thought that maybe these aircraft are coming out of the Aleutian Islands or Alaska. Uh, because that's the general direction they're coming from, and that's the only known American base there. Uh, however, the Japanese are not without their defenses. They have a ring of picket boats around the islands. And the U.S. knew to expect this, but this ring of picket boats is something like 500 miles out from the islands, much further than the Americans could predict. Uh, so Halsey's scout bombers were able to find some and sink at least one, uh, but still very, very far out from Japan, more than 10 hours steaming away from the uh, planned launch point, over 170 miles further than where they expected, they, the ships actually run into pickets. And, uh, and, and so the light cruiser Nashville is tasked with sinking this picket. She has 15 rapid-firing six-inch guns, uh, but it takes her gunners over 30 minutes to sink this little wooden fishing boat. Uh, so Halsey is not pleased. It has undoubtedly radioed Japan and told them that the Americans are coming. And it had, in fact. Uh, Halsey's force is already split up. In order to make the final high-speed run towards Japan, he had left his eight destroyers and his oilers behind. So it's just his two carriers and his four cruisers. Now the Japanese know that they're there, so they can start scrambling air defenses. Uh, their carriers, many of them at this time, are in Japanese waters and can be sortied, uh, as are other major parts of the fleet, including submarines. Uh, and so Halsey's fleet is mostly defenseless, with one of his carriers not even able to launch its own aircraft. So uh, he gives the order to launch the strike early, or he at least approves of it. Uh, depending on who you ask, different people give the order. Doolittle and Captain Mitcher on Hornet discuss this uh, and both agree that they should launch right then and there. Uh, Halsey gives the, the final approval for the launch and is often credited with it. Uh, and so the aircraft have to launch early, which means that uh, even 
loading them up with spare fuel, making them heavier and more difficult to take off, they might not have enough to get to the uh, friendly bases in China. And that's the plan. These planes can't land on their own carriers. They can be modified to take off. They could not be modified to land. So they've got to fly over, drop their bombs, and then go somewhere. The U.S. initially talked to Russia. Russia is an allied power. Hey, Russia, can, can we just land where you are in maybe Vladivostok? Vladivostok? But the uh, Russians have a non uh, non-aggression pact with the Japanese, and being in the middle of a war with Germany, uh, with all their forces out in the west, they did not have many defenses in the east, and they had previously fought a couple of engagements with Japan, uh, and so if they were to help the Allies in the Pacific, Japan could easily invade um, Russian areas in the east, and they wouldn't have any forces to defend themselves. So uh, they said, no, nah, we, we, we can't really help you, no. Uh, so, Chiang Kai-shek says, hey, if you can get to China, free China will help you. The, the nationalist government will help you. The U.S. already has a volunteer fighter squadron, famously now known as the Flying Tigers, under General Claire Chenault in China. Uh, interestingly, Chenault is not told about this beforehand, or else he might have been able to uh, help more. He had a pretty big contact network in the area, and he may have been able to help recover the aircraft. And so Chiang Kai-shek says that we, we, Nationalist China, will provide some airfields, some backup airfields, and we will put up light beacons, radio beacons, uh, to help the aircraft come in. <sighs> that doesn't end up happening. The planes launch early. Halsey doesn't radio ahead and tell the Chinese that uh, the Americans are coming early. So none of the airfields are set up to receive them. Not because the Chinese weren't going to, but because they weren't told that the attack was being pushed forward. And so none of these bombers are able to make it to their airfields. Because of when they launched and where they launched from, they are flying a greater distance, um, and they would be arriving at their destination at nighttime. Nighttime landings with B-25s haven't really been attempted much yet, much less perfected. Uh, so all of the air crews end up ditching, except for one. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, each bomber is holding 2,000 pounds of bombs, much less than it should be rated for, but they're trying to get about an extra third of range out of these aircraft. Uh, in, in fact, these B-25s end up flying about 22 to 2300 miles uh, and staying in the air for 13 hours, which is a record for that airframe. In the days before aerial refueling, what you could carry was what you had, and the, these were the only B-25s modified for such a long-range mission. The aircraft are modified to carry 2,000 pounds of bombs each. They are attacking a number of targets around Japan. They have specific targets uh, selected, but really it's what can you find, because uh, they're coming in at wave top height and popping up just as soon as they start to approach their target, getting up to a, bom a bombing altitude and then hightailing it out of there. So they can't really make multiple bomb runs and line up on a target and their target isn't being illuminated by previous aircraft. and. Uh, so it's not ideal conditions for a raid. It's not supposed to do much damage. If, if you compare this raid to the later uh, B-29 raids that the U.S. launches on Japan, it's nothing. It, it's practically nothing. Uh, and so the aircraft arrive over Japan over a number of different cities. Uh, this is really more of a fear and morale thing. So hitting multiple points around the island is important rather than concentrating on a single target. They're supposed to prioritize military targets uh, and, and they try and, and line up for that, but you know, Japanese military targets uh, often are in the middle of cities and civilian population centers, and so there are civilian casualties along with uh, military targets being damaged. No damage that isn't pretty quickly repairable, but, you know, it's enough. They're, they're even able to hit the light aircraft carrier Ryuhu, which is still fitting out, and the damage forces it to uh, 
extend some time onto her construction, which makes her miss the uh, mid-war carrier battles, which are an important thing affected by the Doolittle Raid. So, uh, the bombers all drop their bombs over a couple different cities. One uh, has inexplicably used more fuel than the rest and definitely can't make it to China. Uh, whether they were going a little faster, had burned more fuel on takeoff, or uh, had hit nose winds that the others hadn't, or just were a less efficient aircraft for some reason, or maybe had lower octane fuel somehow. Uh, for, for any number of reasons, one of the aircraft doesn't have the same range as the others and is forced to divert to Russia, lands near Vladivostok, and uh, because Russia is neutral in the Pacific War, they are supposed to impound the aircraft and the aircrew. So, uh, those five people are held prisoner in Russia up until 1943, so for uh, over a year, and uh, eventually they are able to escape, which is to say that uh, the Russians allow them to escape to placate the Americans and get these aircrew back, uh, while also being able to go to the Japanese and say, hey, we, we tried to do our part, we were impounding them, but those pesky Americans just ran away. And they were able to uh, escape from Russia into Iran, which was partially occupied by Great Britain during World War II, and turn themselves into the British there and eventually make it home. Uh, the other 15 air crews are able to make it to uh, China. One ditches near the coast, and that's where two of the uh, pilots drown, and the other three are captured. Uh, another one barely makes it over the, the coast, and her five air crew are all captured, and it's... Uh, three of these eight which are executed. The rest are able to avoid capture and fly far enough inland uh, to be out of areas directly controlled by the Japanese. Uh, at least one aircraft goes down in the mountains and uh, an air crew member falls off a cliff. Uh, another one goes down bad in the mountains and all five of the air crew are injured. Uh, and at least one has a leg amputated by the flight surgeon in China. Uh, one, one of the air crew was a uh, surgeon, fortunately. Um, the other air crew members are able to go down and find friendly Chinese who help them uh, eventually make their way through China to some friendly controlled areas. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle eventually makes it to General Claire Chenault. Uh, they receive help both from the Chinese, but also from an American Baptist minister named John Birch. Uh, and Birch had been ministering in China uh, as a missionary for uh, a couple of years by that point. He could speak the language, he knew his way around. Uh, and he's a really interesting individual, in addition to by helping the Doolittle Raiders make it to the Flying Tigers, uh, he is introduced to General Chenault, and General Chenault is looking for an American who speaks both Chinese and English to help him and, and who knows the country. And so uh, Birch is made an officer in the Army Air Corps, or Army Air Forces, and uh, continues to help the war effort throughout World War II. Uh, and he even serves as an OSS operative at the end of the war, Office of Strategic Services. So uh, basically the, the World War II predecessor equivalent to the modern day CIA. And while working with OSS, shortly after Japan surrenders, he is on a mission um, behind communist Chinese lines. In addition to the Japanese invading China, there is a civil war between uh, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist Chinese and Mao Zedong's communist Chinese and some other warlord factions. Uh, and so everybody's fighting everybody uh, throughout the war. Birch and his group are sent out on this mission. He's wearing his army uniform. He's got a sidearm. He's got a radio. Uh, and different Chinese groups he keeps running into uh, keep 
trying to take his weapons and radios and other equipment. And he says, I'm American, I'm on a mission. He, he keeps going, and then eventually he runs into a group that uh, executes him for his stuff and imprisons the rest of his party. Uh, and since he was killed by the Chinese after World War II, many consider him to be uh, the first casualty of the Cold War. The other flight crews are all make it eventually to Allied lines. They're repatriated to American forces. And uh, like I said earlier, by the end of the war, some 13 of them have died in combat, uh, in addition to the ones lost during the raid. The rest survive and uh, make it back home and have annual reunions up until about 2013 when uh, they're, they're too old, there aren't many of them left. In 2019, shortly after the wreck of the Hornet was discovered, the final member of the Doolittle Raiders passed away. Uh, so, so some of these guys were with us until relatively recently. They, they were still around by the time I started working here at the battleship. But unfortunately, none of the 80 Raiders are left today. So, what are some repercussions of the attack? My favorite repercussion is uh, a reporter asks Roosevelt where the attack originated. Roosevelt obviously can't say how this happened. Um, so he says that the aircraft must have flown out of Shangri-La. Everybody thought this was hilarious, uh, including the U.S. Navy, which was building so many aircraft carriers that they ran out of traditional names in the traditional naming convention for their aircraft carriers. Uh, and so they named one of their aircraft carriers Shangri-La. And Shangri-La was an Essex-class full-bore fleet carrier. And uh, because of propaganda reasons, they rushed her construction. And so she was the highest hall-numbered uh, Essex-class carrier to make it into the war. And she continued to serve uh, through the post-war years. That's my favorite uh, repercussion from the attack. My least favorite repercussion for the attack, uh, the Japanese send about 10,000 soldiers into the provinces that had uh, helped the American air crews or were believed to have helped the American air crews. And uh, they wipe cities off the map and kill an estimated 250,000 Chinese civilians. Uh, they, they do this with guns and bullets, and they also use biological and chemical weapons on the Chinese civilians. Uh, in fact, a number of them would be tried for war crimes after the war. Uh, other more strategic outcomes of the raid, the Japanese are shocked and embarrassed that the Americans are able to do this. They had been telling, the, the Japanese military had been telling the civilian population and leadership that Japan was completely safe. We've built up this ring of islands around ourselves, and it's impenetrable. They, they can't get here. American bombers had overflown the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. The, the Americans could get here. And the Japanese knew that aircraft carriers had launched the attack because of their picket boats, and uh, they believed that the American carriers were going to continue coming closer to Japan. They knew that no American carrier aircraft could launch their attack from where they were spotted. Uh, so they were preparing their own forces to attack the American carriers and defend against American aircraft the next day or two days later when it was thought that those aircraft could reasonably arrive. Obviously, uh, they had not prepared for army bombers. Nobody had ever done that before. I'm not sure anybody's ever done it since in wartime. Uh, and so they were caught flat-footed. And even though they had carriers on hand that could have gone out and hunted the Americans... They, they weren't ready for that sort of attack. So the Japanese decide that uh, this attack either came from the carriers or it came from the Aleutian Islands. We've got to neutralize both of those targets. And so that's when the Midway operation was devised. Midway was the furthest west of the American possessions. So taking that gives the Japanese an airfield close to Hawaii. Uh, knocking out the Aleutian Islands as part of that campaign will remove many of the American Western possessions and expand the Japanese ring of defenses. And an attack 
on Midway has to be answered by the Americans, which means committing their aircraft carriers. And the Japanese have by far the better carriers and aircraft at this point in the war, uh, and the better trained pilots. So surely they will win such an engagement. They can take Midway and then the American carriers will come out, they can destroy them, uh, and then they are protecting the empire. Well, as we all know, um, the Americans are able to read the codes for the Battle of Midway and they're able to put their carriers in ambush and catch the Japanese rearming and refueling and destroy four Japanese carriers for the loss of one American carrier, greatly evening the odds in the Pacific. This ends Japanese aggression and uh, allows the United States to go on the offensive just a couple months later in Guadalcanal. Not only was forcing the Japanese to commit to a battle in the Americans' favor and caused by the Doolittle Raid, spreading out the Japanese forces was in the Americans' favor and caused by the Doolittle Raid. The Japanese didn't group all 10 of their aircraft carriers into one force to overwhelm the three American carriers. They sent two down to the Coral Sea, and they sent a couple up to the Aleutian Islands, and they sent uh, left a couple with the battleships that they also sortied, but much behind the carriers, and only four Japanese aircraft carriers participated in the actual attack on Midway. These four carriers had not had their air groups replenished uh, after, through the first six months of the war, uh, and so the three American carriers were able to attain relative parity in the battle space north of Midway uh, and eventually win that battle. Japan could have probably won that battle even though the Americans broke their codes and caught them off guard uh, had they grouped more of their carrier assets together in one place. So the Doolittle Raid uh, being a secret and coming from one of a couple of places forces them to it doesn't force them to do it. They, they could have still launched these operations in sequence, but, uh, you know, Yamamoto loves a complex plan. Uh, so they try to do this all at once, spread out their forces, and they are in turn defeated in detail. And that is the biggest success of the Doolittle Raid. It raises American morale, uh, critically buys uh, American public opinion an extra two months for the Battle of Midway which it has heavily influenced. For those reasons, the people of the Allied Nations owe the 80 Doolittle Raiders a huge debt of gratitude. Doolittle himself believed that because he lost all 16 of his aircraft and a number of his aircrew, uh, that he would be court-martialed for failing in his objective. The reality couldn't be further from the truth. He completely succeeded in all of his actual objectives uh, and he would be awarded the Medal of Honor by President Roosevelt when he returned to the United States. And he would be promoted twice. He would bypass the rank of full bird colonel to go straight to brigadier general. And he would go on to command three different air forces in the United States, the European theater, and the Mediterranean theater of operations during the war. There are a number of books directly on the Doolittle Raid, or mentioning the Doolittle Raid, too many for me to list all at once. If you're not the book learning sort and you prefer, prefer to get your information through visual mediums, you're watching YouTube after all, uh, there are a number of other movies that portray the Doolittle Raid. Some movies like Midway or Pearl Harbor show the Doolittle Raid in part. Uh, other movies like 30 Seconds Over Tokyo based on the memoirs of one of the Doolittle Raiders, show or focus exclusively on the raid and the actions of the Americans following it. I recommend uh, watching 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. That movie is uh, a little bit old. It's got Spencer Tracy and Robert Mitchum in it. So it, it's an old black and white movie. Uh, definitely worth a watch. Also, any uh, network executives out there or, or film producers probably worth a remake nowadays. Uh, honestly, the two modern movies to take a take on it, Midway and Pearl Harbor, have both been pretty unwatchable in my opinion. Uh, and while 
They both capture certain parts of the essence. Pearl Harbor does a really good job of showing the uh, decision to move the raid forward and uh, how high stakes that decision was. Uh, ne neither one is, is a particularly awesome portrayal of the uh, of the raid. What's your favorite movie or book on the Doolittle Raid? Let us know in the comments section down below. What's your favorite military raid like this? I love the Doolittle Raid, but Operation Chariot, HMS Campbelltown's raid on San Nazaire, is probably my favorite. Let us know what your favorite is in the comments section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of businesses and private individuals like yourselves. In fact, the support from private individuals has allowed us to go from making one video a month or one video a week to five videos a week. So uh, if you would like to continue to support us, there's a link in the description below uh, to a place you can donate. Also remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when we create new content. Thanks for watching.